I took all the material, or at least most of the material for today's talk from the suttas. It didn't come from here, it all came from suttas, okay? And today the talk, uh, we're going to um, share with you what the Buddha um, said would be the mind of an enlightened being. Okay? So, first and foremost, question. What does it take to be enlightened? There's a million dollar question. How, who will pay a million dollar for this? I've got my publicity manager there. <laughs> what does it take to be enlightened? This came from a, or this comes from a, um, from Anguttara Nikaya, Book of Nine. And in it, Book of Nine means nine points. Buddha talks about what does it take to enable one to be enlightened. And the first one on that list is friendship. Good friends, good companions, uh, good buddies. People who will walk with you on this journey. I've said time and again that this uh, path is not easy. Many a times you may be tempted to give up because it is tough. You're trying to understand your mind and your mind is such a jungle that for the longest time, the only way you could cope with, with your mind was probably to bury it, not to think too, too hard, not to think too much, spend a bit of your time caught up with all kinds of, um, of activities, all kinds of distraction. For the longest time, a lot of us would use the distraction to cope with the mind. But in this journey, you have to study that mind. And the attempt to understand this mind, particularly at the initial period is very tough, it's very hard, it's very painful, it's dukkha arya sacha to the infinite degree. For those of you who have been to a hardcore retreat, meditation retreat, I'm not talking about spa retreat, <laughs> a hardcore meditation retreat, one of those that put you in a corner and tell you, don't move until I let you out type, huh? And, and that one is really to Karya Sacha. I've seen uh, people break down and wear their way th through the retreat. It's, it's possible. So what you need, therefore, is external support. Friends. Dhamma friends. Karyana Mitta. Not friends will tell you, hey, let's go drinking, la, Belkina. Today we cannot take it, we just go drink. Okay? Let's bury ourselves in some beer. No, huh? it's Dhamma friends. People who are like you on this journey, like you committed to the path, like you keen to know what is Dhamma and how does it feel like at the end of the day. And therefore, hopefully the two of you or the bunch of you will sink a little, meaning to say when I'm down, someone is up. If I'm down and he's down and he's down and he's down, chum, all down at the same time, not so good. Lah. So it should be a bit sync, okay? And if there are more of you, there's a higher chance that there will be some complementary, complementarity, lah. some, some sync, some up, some down, encourage each other and so on. Ananda had this conversation with the Buddha. And the Buddha, and Ananda proudly Happily, happily, don't use the word proud, huh? happily said to the Buddha, friendship is half the holy life. Buddha said, no, it's the whole of the holy life, the whole thing. Whether you can make it or not depends on whether you manage to find good Dharma friends. In other words, whether you can complete this journey successfully or not depends on whether you can find good Dharma friends i.e. come to Buddhist fellowship <laughs> amongst other Buddhist centers. 
Because it's in these places that you will find your Dharma friends. Lah. You're not going to find it in a pub somewhere, right? So the odds are you'll find it in, uh, in a centre like this. Okay. The second thing, and this is important. You see, the first one talks about the support network that you have to build for this journey. The second one talks about what's within you, in you. A lot of us know about the precepts, right? We even recited it in Pali, how clever we were. <laughs> but, but I have actually been told by some that five precepts are so many. Tough. Leh. This one, what is written here? To be virtuous. Dwell restrained by the Patimokkha. Possessed of good conduct and resort, seeing danger in minute faults, having undertaken the training rules, he trains in them. This is even harder. Not so much just that there are so many more rules. It's not that. It's that now that you know that you are trying to see your mind, understand that mind, and you are told, that what little temptations you cave into will affect the quality seeing. What little temptation you give into is going to affect your seeing. Why does it, why does it work like that? Because every time, every time you give in to a negative thought, to a negative instinct, the mind shakes. And you're trying to get it settled down so that you can see itself. You want it settled down, you don't need to shake. So every time you do something wrong, think of it like that. Nah. I get you a cup of a glass, a clear glass of water. I put sediments at the bottom, okay? Every time you give in to a negativity, it's as good as shaking this glass then it gets all murky. How are you going to see what's in there? So you can let it settle. Every time it settles, you go shake it again. And that's what we do on a regular basis, you see. Everyone wants to see our mind, right? We say we want to see our mind. Uh, so we say, must see. Okay, try, 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 try to see. Then little, little things, we get annoyed. Little, little things, we get tempted. We get restless and so on and so forth. And every time we cave in, we are effectively shaking that glass. So here the Buddha said, not only are you possessed, not only are you possessed of good conduct, not only, not only are you restrained by the Patimokkha. In other words, not only are you restrained by your precepts, restrained by your desire to do good, do no evil, not only are you trying to restrain yourself from doing from, on that, you are mindful that even the smallest caving into temptation is a problem. Ignore the spelling. Seeing danger in minute faults, even in the smallest, in the smallest thing, you are mindful that you cave in, that's it, shake the glass again. Now, this was advice given to monks practitioners who wanted to see Nibbana. So no scared. I see all the very distraught faces around <laughs> me. Eh? All the faces as if it's <laughs> But what it means is that if you are going for the final goal, if you are really interested in Nibbana and Arahanthood, it goes down to this level. But since we are all lay people and have modest aspiration, <laughs> some, some more modest than others, then be mindful of this. Just be mindful that every time you do wrong, I'm not even telling you, I'm not even saying giving in to temptation. In our case, uh, lay people and all, in our case, it's probably should I score or not? Should I eat or not? You know, the, that, that, that kind of temptation. Or, or nastier ones, like, should I smack the mosquito or not? 
the louder ones, or the more gross ones. Okay. Ah, just be mindful that when you give in, it will create problems. So every time you act to restrain yourself, rejoice. When you act to restrain yourself and you successfully restrain yourself, rejoice that you, you did it. Don't just take it for granted that you should do it. And if you don't do it, therefore you're a bad person for the whole year. Watch the mind. Don't smack. Worse, you're meditating. You want to smack mosquito. <laughs> uh, no need sayang. With the pressure, they will die also. No, let it be. Let it be. Let it be. But, okay, we'll talk about the mosquito later. We will discuss the mosquito discourse. So, okay, uh, the point here being that you know you're restrained, you know you need to restrain, you know that every time you give in, you shake that glass. You just know that. And then it's your call, your choice. How often and how hard you want to shake that glass. Okay? This one, it's beautiful. You get to hear talk concern with the austere life that is conducive to opening up the heart that is on fewness of desire on contentment on solitude on not getting bound up on arousing energy on virtuous behavior on concentration on wisdom on liberation on the knowledge and vision of liberation i lost how many people already <laughs> What it means is this, that in the course of your practice, to help you with the practice, it is very helpful if you can listen, read, come across material that deals with how to let go, how to, lead moder how to have moderation in life. A monk, we talk about austerity. For lay people, we talk about moderation. And when you hear moderation, your mind doesn't go into a spasm. Oh, moderation, ooh, scared. That's a spasm. Instead, it is conducive to opening up the heart. When you hear about letting go, when you hear about moderation, your instinctive reaction is, nice, I'm happy hearing this. There is joy that arises in your heart. You know you're on the right track, uh, mind, mind you. You know you're on the right track that you are developing and you're developing well if you hear these themes and your heart light up, your heart rejoice. So when you hear about, oh, be content, don't want to have so many desires, good to go into the forest and enjoy the quiet, the solitude. Don't get too caught up on, have, be energetic. Energy, arousing energy, this energy is very specific. This energy is about doing the right thing, cleaning up that mind allowing the sediments to settle. This energy is not just normal energy. It's not saying, let's get going spring cleaning today. It's not that, huh? It's about arousing energy for restraining the negativities in the mind, purging the negative, negativities in the mind, bringing on the positivities in the mind and let them proliferate. So do good, do no evil in a big way. Arousing energy for that. That's why next thing, on virtuous behaviour. On concentration. When you hear talk about meditation, you vary the on, you know, you just go for it and get all excited and happy. When you hear about wisdom, what brings wisdom? You want to take notes. When people talk about liberation, it makes your day. And specifically, knowledge and vision of liberation. It should send you into 
seven heaven of delight. <laughs> Eight, if you can manage. Okay? So, the point of this uh, stanza here, the point to bear in mind is, when you hear these themes, your heart open up. You get very happy. You want to hear some more. You want to press the replay button. Again, again, that replay button. Okay? Okay. <clears throat> Number four. Within yourself, within yourself, you have aroused energy for abandoning unwholesome qualities and acquiring wholesome ones. You're strong, firm in exertion, not casting off the duty of cultivating wholesome qualities. Note the Buddha kept, kept saying this. Kept saying this. This is about the third time he's making this point. That it is so important for us to be mindful of what's the content in the mind. What did you let into your house? Your mind is your house. Did you, leave, did you leave the door open and let all those wonderful thieves come in? Then take the broom and chase them out. Clean them out. And if you don't have good, nice people in the house, you better go find some. And then when they are there, have a party. That's essentially what it means. And look at what he said. You have to be strong, firm in exertion. Not easy. When we sometimes want to do the right thing, it's not easy. You fight against your own instincts sometimes. I want, if I don't stand up for my right, they are going to say that I have got no guts. <laughs> Why? You not familiar with the word guts? <laughs> you see what I'm saying? And then you, you are, must stand up for your rights, must stand up for your rights. A practitioner, why? Sudala, let it go. Let it be. And when you let it be, you're a happier person. And you, but you have to be strong enough to do that. Strong enough to overcome your own instincts. And your own instincts tell you to fight back. Chong back, you know. That's what your instincts will tell you. Your better half on that wonderful day is not your better half and calls you name. Why you never do this? And then all our defences come out and we fight back. Oh, but we've got to contain your instincts. You're a practitioner, you have to do ah, Okay, never mind, never mind, let it go, let it go. So it's not easy. Forgive. Forgive, two syllabus words. So easy to say, but so difficult to do. Sometimes easier to forget. Because we're amnesic, ma. <laughs> Don't remember many things. As you grow older, you forget more things, right? So sometimes easier to forget, harder to forgive. If you can remember, you just hold on to something. But the bigger thing is to forgive. And when you forgive, you will forget. It comes naturally. That you forget doesn't mean you're forgiven, okay? That you have forgotten doesn't mean you're forgiven. Look, not the last one. Casting, not casting off the duty of cultivating wholesome qualities. The duty is to our practice. It's to our self. The duty, we think, we think we're doing the world a favour by doing the right thing. Thing. But no, Buddha is saying you're doing yourself a favour by doing the right thing. Okay? That's the difference. Now, number five is interesting. This is and has been his definition of what is wisdom in Buddhism. The person is wise. He possesses the wisdom that discerns the arising and passing away, which is noble, penetrative, and leads to the complete destruction of dukkha. Wisdom, in the Buddhist context, therefore, means 
the ability to see and understand. Discern is to understand. Oh, this is happening and you know what it means. To discern the arising and the passing away. What does it mean? It means for every sensations, mental and physical sensations that you have, you see it arising and you see it pass away. Why is that so important? This is a very critical first step to understanding the rest of the Dhamma story. If you are in your meditation, you can't even see the arising, the change in other words. If you can't even see change, if you can't even see anicca, impermanence, you want to see anatta? <laughs> it's very tough. In fact, uh, very difficult. <laughs> it, you have to start with anicca because that one is the most obvious. Don't believe it, happily smack yourself. Uh, don't do it now, later can. <laughs> you smack yourself, you can immediately feel the sensations change. Physical, mental sensations change. It arises and it will fall away. And you need to see that. And the Buddha said, this knowledge, it's penetrative. In other words, with this knowledge, it leads you to understand something else, the rest of the Dhamma story. It clicks in there, it will start clicking. You don't even click here. Forget about clicking, you've got to go home and practice some more. You understand? Okay. Once you've done those things, now you've got to do these. You have to develop these others. There's a meditation object. How do you let go? So the things that you need to let go, the things that you have to teach your mind to let be, are, lust, craving in other words, ill will, negativity, yeah? restless thoughts, or just plenty of thoughts. And I, the I, conceit. How do you get rid of these four things? Perception of unattractiveness, so the 32 parts type of meditation, enable you to develop some distancing towards your own form, towards your own craving for flesh. Uh, you teach the mind to see both sides of anything. Many a time when we are drawn towards something pretty, something nice, we tend to just focus on the beauty. This one is teaching balance. Look at the other side of the coin, in other words. We get very caught up with beauty, we will be attracted, we will be, um, we will crave for it, you will last for it. But if you start to pay attention to the other half of the story, everything beautiful, there is another side. And once you begin to see the other side, you develop balance. And from that balance, you develop distance. And you can then let be better. When we get too attached, when we get too drawn to something, very often we are very caught up with the nice side, right? And then we tell ourselves, ah, we must let go, we must let go. But meanwhile, we're still holding on to the very nice side, you know? Beautiful flower, beautiful flower, but must let go, must let go. Then you hold on like that. Lah. Until you cannot crush already, then you look at it. Lah. Maybe that's when you will let go. Oh yeah, the one right here. You get what I'm saying? So, practice on the balance. Ill will. How many of us would say that on a regular basis, the arising of annoyance, arising of temper, 
quite spontaneous. Lah. Too shy to say, huh? How many of us will say we never lose temper? One? No lah. Huh? Ah, good, good, good. As a practicing Buddhist, you should be getting lesser. Okay. Loving kindness. To be developed that will help you abandon ill will. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with loving kindness meditation, read Karaniya Mita Sutta. Karaniya Mita Sutta, the Sutta on uh, loving kindness. Uh, the way to do it is to develop some balance in the mind. You start to let go, you start to learn moderation, you start to learn humility, don't hold, too much to your, don't, don't hold on too much to yourself and so on and so forth. Then the metta, the loving kindness can arise. Okay? It's not a whole series of conversation to yourself. It is training the mind not to hold on to things. And you'll notice that when you start to not hold on to things, when you start to um, trim your own ego, the sense of goodwill towards others should come up more spontaneously. Okay? Restless thoughts. Many of us have a problem with constant arising of thoughts. Buddha's uh, solution to that is mindfulness of breath. If you don't believe, uh, all you need to do is to just breathe deeper. Breathe deeper, breathe a little harder than normal, and suddenly you feel better. Yes? Try that, try. Just breathe, uh. breathe is free. <laughs> yes? All you just have to do is just breathe a bit deeper, and suddenly you feel better. But of course, if you keep breathing deeper all the time, you're going to hyperventilate <laughs> la, and start getting woozy a bit. You're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to just breathe once, twice, and then go back to something more regular. Mindfulness of breathing is to watch the process of breath going in and out. And if you can just rest the mind there, thoughts go off. Reason being, your mind pays attention to one thing at a time. And if there is a problem with too many thoughts, trying to watch a rising of thoughts can help if you're a very skilled meditator, you're very skilled at mindfulness practice, it can help and it, it will work. But if you're not very skilled, you don't spend your entire day or just one hour, spend an hour looking at the mind, then it's very difficult. Every time you try to look, you see more thoughts. All right? So the way to do it is not to wow, watch the thought arise, then you're going to caught up with the marketplace really. But to look at the breath, as what the Buddha said, watch. Breathing, mindfulness of breathing, okay? The last one, we constantly cannot let go of the I. I get so many questions about how, uh, how to <clears throat> let go of I. What does it mean? There is no, this one got no shortcut lah. Some things got shortcut, this one got no shortcut. This one, you really have to look at the arising and the falling away and therefore perception of impermanence. If you keep seeing, I'll explain this once, if you keep seeing your emotions, your physical sensations coming and going, it comes and then it goes. It comes, a new one comes along. And it keeps flipping like this. In the process of seeing this flip flop, flip flop, flip flop, flip, flipping all over the places, constant change of emotion, constant change of thoughts, of mental, physical experiences. At some point, it may dawn on you that all these experiences are condition based, meaning this one that you are feeling now, you're experiencing now rest on something before that, which rests on something before that, which rests on something before that, and so on. And what you are experiencing now will lead to the next experience and the next and the, and the next. This is conditionality. And when you start to see your mind being like this, you may see a rhythm. 
It's a process. It's a thinking process. You are experiencing a thinking process. But when you experience the thinking process, you are caught up with it, you didn't see it in bits. You watch a cartoon, you don't realise that it is made up of parts. The cartoon has a figure, 30 pages for him to walk from one corner of the room to the other. 30 pages of conditions allow you to have five minutes experience, in other words. And you don't realise that when you don't see the change. But when you start to see the change and you start to see the flipping of the pages, perhaps you may realise that you are no more than experiencing process. And in this process that you're experiencing, you keep calling it I. And that's my name. You created the I to experience the process. The Buddha mentioned how someone can realise Dhamma. Five ways by which one might realise Dhamma. It's not all five you must do. Huh? At any one time, one of them will hit you. Okay. The first is when you are listening to a talk. So being taught by a teacher or a fellow monk. When you're listening to someone talking, someone says something that <coughs> triggers something in your mind and it speaks to you. And then, at that moment, you see Dhamma. How many of you have seen Dhamma? Like, like that, now. <laughs> Jia yu, okay? We continue. So as you're sitting there, listening, listening, and then suddenly, Eureka! Enlightenment. Ah, then it's number one. Ah. That's how you realise. Okay? The second one is, you yourself, explaining Dhamma to another and then the answer strikes you. So now you're very kilat already. Right? You've been listening, you've been reading, you've gone for classes, you've scored the A's. So clever you are. And then so now you teach Dhamma, right? You share Dhamma. And then suddenly, in the process of sharing, the answer came to you. This is Anicca. That is Anatta. And this is conditionality. These are all the things you need to know. Huh? When I say answer strikes you, huh, it's not 2 plus 2, 4 answer. Okay? It's very specific Dhamma answers. What is, what is impermanence? What is soullessness? Substancelessness? What is dukkha? What do we mean when we say, when we say four noble truths? Eightfold path. What do we mean when we say karma? And the answers come to you while you are teaching Dhamma. That would be, be quite nice. In the time of the Buddha, Anuradha was like that. That was how he realised. He said that he, well, he was an anagami, so the stage of sainthood. And he was saying, I'm not sure why, but I just don't get it. Third stage of sainthood, mind you. And he said, I don't, you know, it's something that's missing, I don't get it. And then he started explaining, and then he got it. So his was this one. It was when he, aha! The aha moment happened when he's talking. That's quite good, huh? Okay, third one. While he is reciting Dhamma in detail as he has learnt it or mastered it. Okay, this is not chanting, huh? This is you understanding what you are. Chanting. So if you are a non-Pali speaker and you happily chant in Pali, unlikely you will realize in Pali. <laughs> through this method. Okay? Through something else perhaps, but not through this method. However, if you are creative enough and you were chanting in English, and that's your first language, huh? or your working language, and then you realize, ah, then correct. Okay, because as you are chanting in a language that you understand, your mind is processing it, trying to understand what it means, processing it. Me, if I chant in Mandarin, I won't realize anything. <laughs> For sure, it may sound very good. I might like it myself, but it, I won't realize anything. 
Okay. <clears throat> Four. Ponders, examines, mentally investigates dharma things and reflects the knowledge he has gleaned. The fourth one is when you have already internalized dharma. For instance, uh, for instance, you come here, you sit, you listen, you digested some things, and you kind of like a particular phrase or a particular stanza up there, you kind of enjoy it, you don't know why, but it kind of speaks to you. Uh, tonight when you sleep and you think about that stanza, right? I think you have a eureka moment, uh, uh, then yours is number four. It's the fourth way by which you have realised the Dhamma. It's quite good, what? Right? It's either you are listening and while you're listening, it hits you. When you're talking and while you're talking, it hits you. When you are reciting the Dhamma and then it hits you. Or when you are reflecting on it. In other words, past. You read it, you're not thinking about it, you're not reflecting on it. Okay? And then it hits you. The last one is meditation. This is meditation. This is when you sit, you observe the phenomenon, learns well a certain object of, of concentration, attends to it well, sustain it well, penetrates it thoroughly with wisdom. Deep in meditation, you look at anicca, impermanence, how your mind, mental sensations arise, and mental sensations fade away. And you keep looking at it. Look until it gets into the mind. This is impermanence. Note, huh? attends to it means you pay very close attention to it. And it's very good concentration. You have to keep it going, sustain it well. But that's not good enough. Meditation per se, holding on to an object, learns nothing. You need to understand it with wisdom. So that you see impermanence, you see breath, uh, breath in, breath out, breath in, breath out. Then you're so good, right? Breath in, breath out, breath in, breath out, breath in. That's it. End of story. Breath. And you happily proclaim, today I had a good sitting, my breath was good. <laughs> No, lah, that's not a good sitting. That's a, that's a nice sitting. That's a nice sitting, but it's not a good one because you didn't look at impermanence of breath. Breath comes, breath goes, arising and falling away. Okay? And then you need to then realize that the breath doesn't stay, it comes and it goes. Your mind holding on to it, holding on to it, may have some degree of craving for it may have did you spot it did you spot that it came and went off or like a thief in the night came and went and left stole everything and you never knew anything so you must you must observe and then note how things change in the meditation okay how do you know that you are sotapanna It might as well go all the way. La. <laughs> this is the great reviewing knowledge of the Sotapanna. So how do you know that you're Sotapanna? If you take all seven, right, then you are. Okay, over here, starting from now. Kosambiya Sutta Majjima Nikaya 48. Three dealing with understand. You know. For yourself, you know. And you understand. What's the difference? Knowing is being aware of something. Understanding you know it and you know why it is like that. You know it and you know why it has to be like that. What is nirvana? I will explain. Hindrances. Okay? Nirvanas are hindrances. There are five sets five types of hindrances. They are very important. Memorize them. Because for all of us, all of us, all of us, these Nivaranas are very common. You cannot tell me you don't have any of them. Because if you are, then you shouldn't be there. You should be here <laughs> conducting the class if you have no Nivaranas all the time. 
When you go deep into meditation and it's a good meditation sitting, there will be no nivaranas. If there is any nivarana, your meditation cannot go deep. You, keep, you get bounced out. To be able to go really deep, there is no nivaranas. Okay? What are these nivaranas? The first one, kamachanda. Sensual delight. Delighting in sensual objects. Sensual, uh, not sexual. Uh. <laughs> sensual. So, for us, for instance, uh, if you enjoy food, what I said about the gourmet, you know, connoisseur, it's French words, connoisseur, meaning uh, you, you, are, you, you are an artist when it comes to appreciating the final things in life, okay? Uh, you, you are into the same thing I used to say last, I, a couple of weeks back, I think, I, I said about, you know, HD and SD and all this lovely, lovely high resolution, Blu-ray. Uh, today, no more Blu-ray, Blu-ray passe. Right? Passe, right? Passe? No, not passe yet. Okay. I don't own Blu-ray. Still the top. Are you sure or not? Sure. Sure. <laughs> Must ask my cameraman. Okay. So, if you are into satisfying your sense organs and it's very important to you and you constantly need to satisfy your sense organs, sense basis. That's one nivarana. That's the first one. And many of us, shukana trip here. Ah, chakwiti, I'll go already. You know, the food already gone. Yeah, the moderation or not, the fact is the arising of, oh, shuk, ah, the arising, nivaranas already. How to concentrate on meditation? Chakwiti, chakwiti. How to concentrate? Very difficult, ah. Sure, very difficult. Okay? So, the very first one is, uh, your mind constantly chasing after sense delight. And it's a habit. Our mind has that habit. Okay? The second one is where part the ill will. Ill will. We don't realize it, but if you watch your mind very carefully, you may see the arising, very subtle, subtle also cannot, very subtle arising of <laughs> No need even to use words. You all know what I mean. It's the noble song, you know, shook. Ill will is not necessary flaming nostrils, okay, that your what gumo to you know? <laughs> it doesn't mean that it doesn't mean that you have fire and smoke coming out of your nostrils and ears. It can be very, very subtle. And even when it is very, even when it's very subtle, it's a nevaranas. It will bump you out of your meditation. You sit quietly, then very nice, then sound pop, and the, the heart goes uh, uh, so if you think ah start ya. Bounce out of concentration already. You get it? So, the first one, chasing after sense desires. The second one, having even the smallest iota of, iota of ill will. Not, not, not satisfied, not happy. That small thing. Huh? Of course, the very intense one is bad. Huh? Very intense one, you can't meditate for three days. I say only, I say only. Maybe, <laughs> maybe you can let go very fast. The third set, it's heavy and low energy. Very heavy, sloth and torpor. Sloth. You know it takes 18 hours to get from point A to B? Sloth. Okay? Torpor is very heavy. So heavy energy, tina midda, makes you want to sleep. When you sit and you meditate, or before, sorry, before you sit and you meditate, you say, I think I'm very tired. Today is a long day. How many of you guilty of that? <laughs> uh, so for those of you who, whom find yourself saying, oh, 
，今天哈、啊、天气很热，受不了 ，cannot meditate， 呃、uh, ，hot also cannot， cold also cannot， cold want to sleep， hot also want to sleep， long day must sleep， short day very tired also must sleep， that kind right， ah， sloth and torpor， that's low energy， meditators have to fight against this one， ah、uh.。It's it's tip, very typical. In fact, a lot of you, oh, you 不敢说而已啊 But I'm very sure a lot of you has have this problem. Yes, yes, huh? Just quietly, just blink at me, can I? Yeah, just blink, blink at me. No need raise your hand. I won't embarrass you like that. But it's okay, lah. Your your wife doesn't know that you are sleeping. Okay, the fourth one, uh, is fast energy. Energy too slow, energy too fast. So udacha kukucha, udacha restlessness, kukucha worry. They are very fast energy. I'm not saying high energy. I'm saying fast. It spins. Now, when you are worried, kukucha. When you are worried, do you see your mind keep going back to the same object? Really like mosquito, right? Fly all over the place or go back to the object. Keep going back to the object. Keep spinning around it and around it and around it. That kind of energy, when you have that, very difficult to sit. If you have that, what should you do? Go jogging. Can't jog. Never mind. Walk fast. Swim. Whatever. You need to work the energy out of your mental system. If you don't work it out your system, it's very difficult to sit. If you have low energy, very low energy, and you find that you can't sit, also get up, walk slowly. No need to walk too fast. Walk too fast, very tired. After that, you say you want to sleep. <laughs> walk slowly, generate the energy first. Okay, rub your your limbs and so on and so forth, just just to keep the momentum going, stimulate a bit. And the last one, which kitchen? <coughs> which kitchen traditionally has been translated as doubt, but that particular translation is inadequate. And the reason why I say it's inadequate is this: you know that for the sotapanna, right? Once you are sotapanna, one of the fetters that drops. Is witchy kitcher, yes? Okay, never mind. Yes, <laughs> one of the factors that drop is witchy kitcher. Same thing, same word. Okay. How many of you would say that you have some doubt about the Buddha's teaching? No. No, right? Most of you wouldn't say that you have any doubt. So are you all sotapanna? <laughs> Because the factor goes, ma. The witchy kitchen fetter will drop. Then you say, "I'm not so the banana. Then how come?" So the the word doubt is not the most appropriate replacement for the word witchy kitchen. I prefer to use the word perplex. That's why I kept using the word perplex. the The idea of this word perplex is this. You you go. I don't know. I don't understand. Can you explain to me? Right? Perplex is. I don't understand. Now you explain to me again, and then you explain. And first says, I still don't understand. I I have no doubt. I know you know the answer. Maybe I am either you're not a good teacher or a poor student. But I don't wait. I don't even know the answer. So I have every faith in you. But I'm very perplex. I don't understand what you're saying. Get it? A lot of us have perplexity. Perplexed because we know Buddha's right. We know there's something beautiful about the Dhamma. We really want to see that Dhamma. We want to see the beauty in it, and we're very, very perplexed. We can't get it. And that's which teacher. So how does that come into the meditation? Because when you sit and you meditate, sometimes you're not sure whether you're doing the right thing. And then you start going, uh, correct now. Uh, eh, supposed to be having this or not? Uh, what like that? Ah, ah, finish. That's it. You're having too many conversation, too much conversation inside there already. You are asking yourself, correct or not? Am I doing the right thing? What am I doing? I yo like that, nah? It can go mad or not, huh? <laughs> Those are perplexed thoughts. 
Aiyah, what is this? Jana, Jana, can't get Jana. What is this Jana? Tomorrow we'll ask somebody. And then five fellas, you ask five different answers. Ask the sixth one who agrees with the second fellow. Ask the seventh one, he agrees with the third fellow. Die. <laughs> See what I'm saying? We're all very, very perplexed. Okay? So, if you are a sotapana, you know, you understand, there is no nivarana unabandoned in you that might so obsess your mind that you cannot know and see things as they actually are. It doesn't say, read this carefully, it doesn't say that there is no more Nivaranas. In fact, the only one that disappear is Vichikicha. For the Sotapanna, the only Nivarana that is gone is Vichikicha. The others are still there. So he is not saying, I don't have Nivaranas anymore. He is saying, there isn't a nevarana that is so powerful that it fog his mind, it shield his mind, it can't see, cannot see things as they are. So even the nevaranas no longer have a lot of power over him. Okay, it doesn't mean he does not have craving, it merely means he can see craving as it is and if you can see craving as it is you can see when craving is not there and he must must see it when it's there know that it's there when it's not there he knows it's not there he sees his mind as it is and he knows that the mind is well disposed for awakening to the th th truths what is this thing about well disposed for awakening? I love the choice of words. I love Hokkien. It's called Zun Zun. <laughs> Precision, Swiss watch style. Precision timing. Okay. It means to say that the mind, the condition in the mind are just right. The conditions in the mind are just right and the truth will dawn on him. He will, it, it's awakening, dawning, arises slowly, in other words. When you are observing your mind, and you observe and you observe, sometime, sometime, you may notice that it's true, things do come and just go. I may not be very good at seeing how they go. I may not be very good at catching when they come. But I can see how it change. So I don't see it disappear completely. I don't see it when it comes up. But I can see that it changes. At that moment, if your mind is disposed, the conditions are just right, your mind is disposed, it will strike you at that point, this is Anicca. This is impermanence. It will strike you. And therefore, the awakening of Dhamma. Get it? You suddenly understood at that point what is impermanence. If you have pain, okay, example, you have pain, pain. Ayo, 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 pain. Okay? I must give some sound effect, otherwise you all fall asleep. <laughs> So you have some ayo ayo pain, right? <clears throat> and you watch the pain. But Panadol not working anymore. You took too many already, you cannot take so many. You know you're not supposed to take so many, right? Uh, what, two? Okay. And then, when you sit there quietly watching the pain, you may notice pain is like a symphony. It can escalate in intensity but it can actually fade in intensity. It is not constant. And you can watch it until it, you see the throbbing, literally. Can you, can you, I know some of you, I know some of you have experienced this. I see it in your eyes that you are 
understanding this point, okay? When you see pain, physical pain, morphing, changing, like a symphony, you know, it goes up, it comes down, it goes up, it comes down. And at that point, if you had already spent time listening to Dhamma talk, reading the Dhamma and so on and so forth, at that point, when it's so quiet, your mind could have awakened to Dhamma on one point, on Anicca. And that's good enough. That's Dhamma. And then you will rejoice. Not, not Sotapana yet, but you will rejoice. <laughs> okay? So, the first thing, do you or do you not know whether there are these negativities, the nivaranas, in you so much that it clouds your ability to see the mind as it is? Are you aware that your, your nivaranas has really gone down so much that you can, you can still see the mind, it's there, you still have craving, but you can see the mind as it is, okay? The second one, and this is only one of seven, there's six more to go. Understand thus, when I pursue, develop and cultivate this view, I obtain internal serenity, I obtain stillness. In other words, he knows how to practice, he knows how to practice, he knows what kind of perspective and understanding has to be developed so that when he is mindful of that perspective, the mind is quiet, the mind is calm. What is this perspective? It's the Four Noble Truths. It's the Four Noble Truths. It's the letting go. It is the not holding on to the eye. And he knows that every time he holds on to that eye, every time he holds on to craving, wanting, he gives in, he's not going to have an internal quiet. He gives in to the eye, it's going to be very, very painful. He gives in to this notion that there is a self, it's going to be very painful. So he learns moment to moment to let go of the sense of the eye, the sense of the self, the sense of the mind. Moment to moment, learn to let it go. Cultivate, you know, pursue, develop and cultivate. Moment to moment, you've got to be mindful of that. And when you are mindful of that, daily life, obtaining internal quiet and stillness, Daily living. Uh, this one is not, oh, meditation. There you sit. I will let go of the eye. One hour later, wake up. Okay, no more. <laughs> My eye is intact. <laughs> this is a moment to moment daily living kind when you are, because you, you, you have to be mindful in the daily existence. Because look, you spend more time meditating or living a daily life? How many of you spend more time meditating? Seriously. <laughs> Even in a retreat, you don't spend more time meditating. Where you spend some time uh, doing your daily activities, then you want to go and sleep, then you want to hide in a corner, chit chat a bit, <laughs> do all kinds of strange things. Uh, 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 I know and I know. But it's okay. This one, it's. Meaning to say, as you are brushing your teeth, as you are driving your car, as you are waiting for buses, as you go off to work, if you do remember, you just be mindful that I don't hold on to the eye so much. Lah. Then if there is a lot of wanting, then you just say, ah, it's okay, lah. doesn't matter. So it becomes a habit. And you know, the point here is he understands. You know, you have to do it like that. If you don't do it like that, you don't get it. That's a trade-off. So no, I can't get it, I can't get it. Of course you can't get it. If you do it, you'll do it like that. This way. 
in a daily existence. Um, so, so this is understanding that you need to live like this and why you need to live like this. And what is this like this? I must learn to let go of your desires and cravings. No, no, small, 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 I must just learn to let it be. And I have to let go of the I. Small, 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 I must let it be. Just let go. And I know, I know that when I do that, I am at peace. Okay, that's what it means. And you are absolutely convinced that there is no other recluse or Brahmin outside this teaching possessed of a view such as I possess. This is very specific. In other words, your understanding, your priorities, your values, they are developed as a result of your walking this path. There is no one else out there who share the same kind of value system and the same kind of understanding about the nature of the world. You believe that, you understand that. It's not that, it is that you know, basically what it means is, you know the teaching is here. It's not somewhere else. So you won't go elsewhere. But then I think it's the I. Hmm? The I, because I will be the rest of activities. We have a bigger I. No, it merely means you have made a choice. It merely means confidence. You say, okay, this is the teaching, this is where I'll get my answer. I can't find this answer elsewhere. So I will continue here. No, no. Who asked you? I understand. You understand. Not, I will go fight for this. It's for you internally to... Basically, what it means is, if you are a sotapana, okay? Let me just rephrase it. If you are a sotapana, you know that your practice is on the right track because there are all these kind of hindrances not there. They come, they go, they're not strong enough to trip you. You know that. And therefore, your mind is able to see Dhamma. Periodically, Dhamma arises, the mind can see it. Because the Nivaranas are not strong enough to trip you, in other words. Second, you also know that you have to learn to let go, you have to learn not to hold on to the eye too much. This is very important for you to continue to enjoy that internal balance, the serenity, the stillness, the balance. And you know that, okay? And you also know that you have to continue walking this path because this is where the answer is. As far as you're concerned, the answer is here. And you're not going elsewhere looking for alternative. You know that. You understand that. That's all it, that's all it means, okay? The next lot is a bit different. Huh? You have to think, you have to reflect. In other words, over here, consider thus. The previous one is a knowledge. You understand, you know. This one is you have to reflect. Now that you think you are a sotapana, in other words, do you possess the character of one who possesses the right view. So one half, the first three, for you to ask yourself, do I know or don't I know? This two here is, now that you think you are, have you changed? Are you any different? Are you like that? Are you like that? Okay? He was talking to monks, you must always remember he was talking to monks. So there will be many monks in his time with a lot of very deep understanding of Dhamma, who may be practicing very well, who's just about the threshold of seeing. And beyond them knowing, yes, I understand and I know these things, they also must ask themselves, have they changed as a person? Are they better people? Do they practice like that? If they don't practice like that, then they are not quite the sutapana they think they are. So here it says, 
Do I possess the character of a person who possesses the right view? And what is this thing? You commit, you may, the word here is you may still commit some kind of offence for which a means of rehabilitation has been laid down, meaning it's not one of those offences that leads to you being expelled from the Sangha. You can continue being a monk. Small thing, small thing. At once you confess and you tell the teacher what you have done and you enter upon restraint for the future. Translate that into our life. What does it mean? It means we don't have so many skeletons in the closet. Lah. You open up the closet, closet empty. Instead of hanging all these skeletons inside there. A lot of us go through life trying to project a certain profile, right? The world, don't know me, don't know me. Know this version that I created specially for you. This version. Version XZY, very good one. If you are walking, if you are the Sotapana that you think you are, then you are not going to have all these skeletons hanging all over. I mean, what you see is what you get, lah, essentially. And then if they are going to do something wrong, they are not afraid to admit it. Okay? Next. You also ask yourself this. Although you may be active in various matters for, the com for his companions, yet he has a, a keen regard for training in a higher state, training the higher mind, training the higher wisdom. Going for arahanhood, in other words. If you are a sotapana, you don't stop there. If you truly have entered the stream, then the instinct of the individual is to continue the journey and continue the journey even as he is caught up in other activities. Maybe active in various matters for his companions. So he may still be engaged in all kinds of activities, but you want to continue training the higher state, training the higher mind, training the higher wisdom. Go on for Nibbana. So if you, if you think, I remember earlier on I was saying that we all have modest aspiration, right? By modest, usually it means, well, some may say, I just want jhana. Well, that was really modest. Lah. <laughs> some may say that, oh, I want to enter the stream. Ah, that was quite good. There's a good aspiration, okay? Then, then you continue with the statement that says, I only want to enter. Then I want to sit. No need to do anything else. Ah, then something is wrong. If you think you have entered, you won't just sit. You will continue practicing. Okay? Because the instinct is to want to continue to finish it. Six. What is the strength of a person who possesses right view? What are your... The oomph. When, when you have... When you are a sotapana, you hear the Dhamma and Vinaya, your mind will chong. You will go and grab it. I want to hear more and more and more. Okay? And you get very inspired when it is proclaimed by the Tathagata. You get very inspired in the meaning. You gain inspiration in the Dhamma, gain gladness connected with the Dhamma. So someone who sees the Dhamma, who understands the Dhamma, derives a lot of joy and inspiration in the Dhamma. I know a lot of you here derive a lot of joy in the Dhamma. If you have the other five, then congratulations. Ah. But the other five will be important, okay? Meaning to say, a lot of us, we are, we are, Dhamma is beautiful. Dhamma is a lovely thing. And a lot of us, when we hear it, we get very happy hearing it. But the joy in itself, not enough. You must understand the Dhamma. So when you are having joy in the Dhamma, it cannot be because Dhamma is so sweet, I like it. It has to be, oh, I understand this. The understanding adds to the thrill. 
It's the understanding that brings more joy. Not just because someone giving the talk is very funny and is a joyous person, so they are very joyous listening. It's not that. It's, it's not that kind of external factor. It comes from within you, internal factor. There are these five aggregates affected by clinging, and the practitioner should abide contemplating the rise and fall thus. In other words, if you are a, a practitioner, you need to watch your mind, be aware of the arising of any of the five aggregates. Arising of any of the five aggregates. What are your five aggregates? Your physical form, your chitta consciousness, or vijnana consciousness. When you see something and you recognize it, perception. When you recognize it, there might be the arising of feelings, recognized feelings. With arising of feelings, sometimes come thought formation, Shankara. Recognize that. So basically, when the mind, when your mind has feelings, arising of feelings, when the mind is aware of object, you see seeing, you see something, you should note seeing. If you hear something, you should note hearing. Such is rupa, such is form, such is arising, such is disappearance. When you have a mental experience, when it comes up, know this particular mental experience came up. So feeling comes up, no feeling comes up. Feeling dissipate, knows it when it dissipate. When he abides contemplating rise and fall in these aggregates affected by clinging, the conceit I am, based on these five aggregates, is abandoned in him. When that is so, the practitioner understands the conceit I am, based on these five aggregates affected by clinging, is abandoned in me. And he has full awareness. It's self-explanatory. It's not? Okay, uh, example. You have the arising of grief. You know that it's the arising of grief. And then when you look at grief, you know that this grief is associated with attachment, right? And it's associated with I am attached to so and so. If you see the grief as merely attachment without the I am so and so, it may be easier to see a rising of grief, a rising of attachment, the dropping of attachment. It's a, it's a cycle. It comes up, it will go off. So if you observe a mental phenomenon, and you observe just that mental phenomenon and detach that from the I. Call it no I. There's no I in this. That is just an experience. The arising and the falling away. When you are fully aware of that, we see the arising, you see it fall away. There is no I in the process. And you're aware of that. The constant holding on to the I eventually will drop. Our problem is we hold on to I a lot. Don't understand. Whatever mental, physical experience that you have, know that when you are experiencing it, that I is sneaking there. If you can just see this as an experience, and kind of like a Velcro thing, you know, strip the eye away from that experience. See, just as a, an experience, without the eye in that, it's easier over time for you to drop. 
So seeing, grief, grief. Grief because of attachment, attachment. Attachment starts to dissipate, grief starts to reduce. No I in it. I didn't push it, it just continued as a cycle by itself. Sure. Fear, okay. No meaning. Exactly. Watch fear. When there is the arising of fear, just watch it. Note it as fear. Don't give it a story. If there is an attempt by your mind to give it a story, your Shankara is forming. Recognize Shankara, formation, thought formation, trying to give story. And observe this effort to try and give a story. Don't go into the story. Just observe that the mind wants to do it. And when you look at it, it will stop. It's like a thief. The moment you look at what the thief is the, it's doing, they will stop. It's when you don't realize it, then it will steal and run. So in the same way, and exa exactly, when you say something and there is no I in it, very often people go into the, what does this mean? What does this mean? If there is no I, there is no meaning. Yeah, 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 that's it it correct. <laughs> it's okay, that's because you're still attached to the eye. When you are less attached, you should watch attachment to eye. When you start to get less attached to the eye, then it is not scary. It is more liberating. Then you're not so obliged to make the eye look good. What is a ghost? What's a ghost? <laughs> Phantom of the opera like that. What if it's like a ghost and you fear? So how do you, how do you, just not, you don't fear? Ghost. That's not a ghost. No, no, no. Her case is not. No, no. Seven months now, ma. Not. Falling, banging the door. You know what you have to do. That's when you must practice meta meditation. <laughs> we will have to speak afterwards about the meta meditation. <laughs> what? It's important is this, the mind of the enlightened, if you are approaching that general direction of enlightenment, eh, that you are drifting in the general direct, direction of enlightenment, you become more and more aware of the arising of your mental and physical sensations. You become very aware of it. So feelings, perception, <laughs> Feeling, perception, um, contact, contact, eye in contact with object, contact, um, your physical form, when it hurts, you just observe it as pain, that's it. And you, when you look at each experience, it comes up. And you don't, and, and you literally look at that sensation and go, not I. There's nothing there. It's just an experience. And there's no self, there's no I in this. And then it will go on its own little uh, journey, arising and fall away by itself. But if you were to identify with it and you internalize it, you own it then you can continue generating and constructing a new story for it. You have pain and then you start to wonder about your, your limbs dropping off because you have created a story for it. And you worry, you know? And you have no leg how? Ah? No problem. If you have, uh, you see your best, your better half talking to somebody, if you're insecure, seeing 
just one conversation you have created a bed, a bedroom scene in your mind. <laughs> just one conversation that we created. It's all created. But if you see seeing, see seeing, then it's just conversation and that's it. You move on. And if you see seeing and let go of I, you may not even notice it. It's not, 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 not the most important thing. You move on. So there are two things going on here. Number one, catch the arising of whatever sensation. Number two, when you catch the arising, say, there's no I in this. When you start off, this is just a practice. You keep, this is, a, when you start, it's just a practice. When you are enlightened, it's part of your instinct. That's the difference. That's why it's called mind, Mahasunyata, it's mind of the enlightened one. Okay? Uh, again, came from the Buddha. When one perceives impermanence, the perception of non-self is stabilized. One who perceives non-self eradicates the conceit I am, which is Nibbana in this very life. Short sentence. There's some long sentences you can complain that you don't understand, but they're very short. Four sentences only. In fact, in fact, two sentences, four lines. Okay? When you see and understand arising and falling away, you will understand impermanence. If you truly internalize impermanence, if you truly internalize the process, if you truly internalize the process, you will understand and see non-self. The perception of non-self is stabilized. You see, it gets in. When you begin to understand non-self, the I am, the notion of I am drops. And when this notion of I am drops, that is Nibbana, the sense of unconditioned bliss. Okay? I can't explain any more than that. <laughs> the rest for you to read by yourself. Okay. So, enlightenment would therefore involve realizing the following. This part? It's easier to understand. Well, this one not so cheap, really. Point number one, okay, uh, if you are going, going, heading there, you should notice that this is happening in your mind. This is a kind of knowledge that will start to arise in your mind if you are heading in the general correct direction. You will start to recognize when there is craving. Instinctively, you will notice craving. When it arises, you know. In all your experiences, you see something, you can see underlining it. Maybe I want it. Oh, very nice. I like it. You look at your own feelings, right? You see something pleasant. Your feelings, huh? You see something, you like it. There's a very high chance I want it. it will surface instinctively. You don't even have to do anything. You look at your own mind. You hear something, you like it. It arise, for you, that is the arising of a pleasant sensation, feeling. I also must go download. <laughs> buy, 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 buy. Don't just go anyhow download, okay? Must buy. If you taste something and it's nice and, you, and it brings out a good feeling, chances are you want to repeat broadcast. Go taste again and again. And why not? Let's try again and so on and so forth, okay? When that craving doesn't exist as a condition, you know. So it is not only when it's there, it's when it's not there. Craving that underpins, that drives you. When it's not there, you also must recognize it. It is not here. When it is there, you must know, of course, because the dukkha is there. Do you understand? So if you, for instance, huh? for instance, you love to eat, oh, yeah. I can't think of another example. 
<laughs> I'm, I'm quite hopeless in that sense. Then you like to eat chakwe tiao, okay? But then you see this wonderful chakwe tiao store and there is no arising of craving. Ah, jackpot. Today, your practice are very good. You get it? So, <laughs> give the poor guy some credit. Uh, yeah, maybe the practice is very good today, you know? Not hungry, sometimes also people want to eat. But the point, the point is, is you, you need to watch your mind. When there is the arising of craving associated with any of the sense organ, you must know. Don't have to beat yourself up over it, but you just need to know that it's there. Why? Because over time, you need to be able to see that this comes and go. Craving comes and go. It is like everything else, impermanent. It's an impermanent sensation. Like every emotions, like every mental, physical sensation, craving is impermanent. It will come and it will go. So if you don't see it arising and falling away, you will get it into your mind that, oh, this is so difficult to manage. How to stop craving? This is like a big giant that comes into the house and refuses to budge. How am I supposed to kick him out? Who asks you to kick him out? You're supposed to see him not as a giant. You're supposed to see him until he becomes a midget. Then that's when you go, <laughs> Okay? If you don't keep staring at him until he becomes a midget, then he will always be a giant in your mind. Get it? This is the practice. The practice is about recognizing the giant for who he is. My favorite example would be that little thing that hides inside them. You all watch Men in Black, right? My favorite Men in Black. Huh? The, the little thing that hides inside there that drives a guy. Ah, when you watch the, 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 the craving properly, he will not be the big guy, he'll be that little thing, eventually. But if you don't watch him at all, there's no way you can get him out. Because you, he's bigger than you imagine. Or rather, he won't. You will imagine him to be really big, very tough. Okay? So, one, when it's there, you see. When it's not there, you know. You have to see it. Two, all the five senses, huh? For all the five sense bases, see and understand. Something arises, craving, it falls away. Watch gratification, danger and escape. What does it mean? It means that you need to understand for yourself. When there is an arising of craving, we give in to it, that's gratification. You give in to it all the time. It creates problem because it generates in you a druggy habit. You need to recognize the danger of it becoming a druggy habit. And if you can see that this is problematic, over time, when you start to practice well, you will start to see that it is possible to break out of the habit. And it can be done. People have done it for 2,500 years. It's tough. That is why Dhamma is not easy. You know, practicing it is not easy. But it can be done. One has to have the faith. Okay? Number three is important. Huh? This is the way to do it properly. When one sees craving as it actually is, with proper wisdom, one becomes disenchanted with the object and eventually the mind becomes dispassionate towards the object. If you keep looking at craving, develop the habit of just watching the energy of craving. It's an energy. After you look at it for a while, you become familiar with it, it becomes softer. Your mind actually gets a bit tired, keeps seeing the same thing. The mind gets tired. The mind gets disinterested. 
the mind turns away by itself. Okay? And as you are observing these phenomena throughout, throughout the observation, you have to keep telling yourself, not I, not mine, and not myself. So even as you are watching craving, even as you are watching desires, contacts, just tell yourself, not I'm not mine, not myself. This is the practice. Okay? Okay? This is about the most depressed group I've ever <laughs> seen. <laughs> Oh, okay, should I just leave it on for you to reflect deeper? <laughs> so, okay, uh, to sum up, watch craving, learn to watch it well, understand how it works, the energy of the craving, you've got to know it very well. When you know it very well, it starts to fade. As a, a, think of it like a, when, it, when you know it very well, its tentacles over you will start to diminish, reduce. If you don't learn to recognize it, it will always waylay you. If you learn to recognize it, you can see him coming. This is craving, you say. I'm watching you already. But if you have never learned to recognize it well, how it arises, and it will fall, it will fall away by itself. And if you don't learn to recognize how it arises, how it sticks around, how strong it gets, how weak it becomes. And when it becomes weak, you will also experience the arising of a joy. I forgot to tell you the joy part. When you watch craving and you just observe it with some degree of detachment, just observe it coming up, hanging around, starts to diminish in strength, and you follow the process, when it starts to diminish in strength, you will feel good. You will start to feel good. Eh, hey, craving does get weaker. You feel good because you gain confidence that it can be handled. And then when it starts to diminish and disappear, because it will disappear, then start again. It will disappear and start again. Okay? When it starts to diminish, and disappear, you will also go, yeah, Buddha right, this thing can come and go. And you feel good about it, you gain faith, you gain strength in the Dhamma, strength in the belief in the Dhamma. Okay? You must remember the delight. When that happens, you remember the delight. And then when it fades away and it starts again, you know how it worked. The last time, it's the same process. It will happen the same way. It will increase in intensity, linger around, starts to fade in intensity before it dissipates and it will start again. It's a cycle. And if you follow the cycle, you track the cycle, you start to recognize the strength of the cycle. That's all it can do to you, nothing more. It doesn't jump out of your brain and then throttle you. It doesn't do that. It can only haunt you like a boogeyman if you allow it to. But once you start to recognize that strength of it, you then know what kind of enemy you're dealing with. It's essentially yourself, but you know what, what you're dealing with. And that's the max it can hit, and this is what happens when it's gone. You recognize both. Recognize where it hits maximum. This is the worst sensation ever. And then when it starts to make turn and it starts to get weaker, you recognize weakening, weakening, weakening. And then you feel good. Must feel good because that's relief. Okay? Feel good about it. Rejoice that this is Dhamma. This is impermanence. And isn't it anatta? Can you now see anatta? It has nothing to do with you. What you went there and you start cranking it. No, it, it went by its own cycle completely uncontrolled by you. It's just gone by its own cycle. And so in this, in this teaching, what we do is, we learn, once you learn how the mind works, you learn to harness the strength of the mind. 
you learn how to bring back the joy until it settles in your heart by itself. You learn not to be afraid of the world. The arising of conditions, you know scared. You're not scared of it anymore. Right now, there may be some of us who are grappling with all kinds of mental fears, mental uh, stresses. And very often, when we grapple with these, we find, we believe, we believe we're fighting a losing battle. Because every time we fight, we get more and more scared. But the reality is, you actually, you have created something and it's your own creation that you are afraid of. You feel that you can't control the mind. And therefore, you should then know that it's anatta, you know, the process. It's all anatta. If, if it's not anatta, you can control it. But you can't. So then what happened? Then what happened is you learn the process and you learn to navigate cleverly. Learn to navigate your mind. You learn to teach the mind how to do the things that will then bring back that joy. So you learn how to bring back joy for yourself from within. You don't look for joy from without. If you look for joy from without, can't find. Temporary. And go spend a lot of money. Okay? Okay, this one got more words. For me, who is dependent, you see, uh, what does it mean by dependent? If you are looking to the external conditions for relief, you are dependent. A lot of us are dependent. And as long as you are dependent, there is shakiness, wavering. That is why the worldling, the average person, would consider his mind to be shaky. Any little thing outside can affect your mood. For me, who is independent, there is no wavering. Why? The joy comes from within. The stability, the steadiness is from within. And when it is from within, you have no shakiness and there is tranquility. Okay? When there is that peace within, when there is tranquility, your mind doesn't go for choices. It doesn't switch all over the place. There is no inclination. When you are not switching, hunting, looking, huh? then there is no planning. There is no reviewing. There is no repeating broadcasts passing away, being reborn. There's just now. There is only here and now. And when there is only here and now, this itself is the end of Dukkha. If you think about this, uh, just as a small taste, right now, look at your mind. Just, just now. Don't think. Just look. Take a peep. For a split second, when you are taking a peep, your mind's not doing anything, right? How many of you don't even know what I'm saying? <laughs> I, I'm, I'm just suggesting, suggesting that you pause. Just pause, okay? Pause. One minute. Uh, no need, no need. One second. Pause. Five seconds. Pause. Okay, yeah, you're all in anticipation of what I'm going to say next, right? In this period of anticipation, what I'm going to say next, you have paused, yes? In this moment of pause, is that dukkha? Get it? Don't get it. <laughs> Do you get it? 
In this one moment when you pause, you are in the here and now. You are not going and coming. You are not planning. There is no reviewing. You are just in the here and now. Except that your here and now might have lasted five seconds. But already in this five seconds, you know there is no dukkha. Get it? This practice will take you to a point where your mind literally pause into the many more minutes, not just five seconds. Okay? And that's what the Buddha keeps saying. That if you practice this path and you walk it right, the mind literally goes into that state where it's in the moment, in the quiet, not depending on anything out there, not wavering all over the place. It's just still and quiet. And you're not in meditation. You're living normal life. Because in meditation, yes, you can pause it, right? Yes? yes? Okay, some of you, yes, but many maybe not, which is why you don't meditate as often. Because when you do meditate well, your mind does get into a, a quiet pause state, okay? And it lasts, it's extended. And it's because it's extended, it's very nice. People have wax lyrical about all these very nice experiences. They've written volumes saying how beautiful it is. And it's just like that. It's this very nice, quiet, still moment. Okay? But the challenge is not to just have it in meditation. It's to get out of meditation in normal life, being able to have a mind that is generally along this line, more or less quiet, more or less still, and more or less at peace. That's what this challenge is about, this path is about. Okay? So, when ignorance is stripped away, you will have the following. You will see your mind as it is. There will be the dissipation of confusion, dissipation of perplexity, clarity as it is. Okay? You will have absolute faith based on knowledge and vision. Meaning to say, in your meditation, when you see the mind as it is, when you see it, that is vision, and you understand it, that's knowledge. Okay? You will start to see the world in conditional parts. What does it mean? Remember what I said earlier, at this very moment, whatever you are experiencing, one moment before condition this. In this very moment, whatever it is, it's going to condition the next moment. Okay? I hear, it goes in, there's contact. When I hear there is contact, it goes in, I recognise the sound, I like the sound, I'm going to buy tapes. I'm going to buy music, thought construction. Hey, since I'm buying, I might as well buy the whole this. So all this thought construction starts and so on and so forth. They are all conditional parts. When you start to understand and see more and more of the mind, you begin to see the mind in literally conditional parts. Bit by bit by bit. Impermanent. You will look inward for the peace. You don't look outward for answers. Okay? And finally, you learn to manage, tame, pacify anger, craving, thirst, the driving force of life. The energy that keeps you alive and keeps you going is craving, it's thirst. And in the practice, you start to realise that this craving can come in very minute, very subtle, very small way, very, very, very subtle. And you have to watch this very subtle form of craving. 
they are so subtle you may not even call it craving. Because craving sounds not subtle. Craving sounds very gross, right? But no. The energy of craving is the same. It's just one thing. One thing energy. And if it's a one thing energy, it can be very, very subtle. I only small, small want it. I want it away. Very little, only very little. I just want it very little. This sensation is just minor in terms of intensity. But if you want something really bad, it's the same feeling, but more intense. Don't get it? Never mind. Go watch your craving. Watch the craving in the different type, in the different in a different form, you will start to recognize that they are all the same. Just different in intensity. So that you really want to travel to Paris. Really, really, really want. Paris. Okay, never mind. Bali. Okay, that you really want to travel to Bali. Okay. That sensation of one thing is very similar to I want to eat ice cream. One. It's the same. But maybe Bali a bit more intense, or Paris luggy more intense. <laughs> Paris quite intense, huh? Ah, okay. Whereas ice cream is not so intense, la, but I still want it. But you look at the energy, it's the same. Just differ differing degree of intensity. And sometimes in daily life, we don't realize it. We, we, we don't realize it because we just give in, you see. It's easy, buy ice cream very easy, go Bali a bit more difficult, but buy ice cream very easy, right? <laughs> so buy ice cream very easy, you just go and buy and then you eat. It never crossed your mind that the craving is the same. So what does it mean for, for a practitioner? It means that it's okay to eat ice cream. <laughs> Perfectly okay to eat ice cream. As long as it's not your fifth tub for the day. <laughs> but seriously, what it means is you just have to watch the energy. It is not about clamming it down per se. To clam and to clam and to clam. I was just explaining to somebody. You see, middle path. One extreme is gratification. The other extreme is self-torture, mortification, right? We all know this, the two extreme. And we spend our life as practitioner, Buddhist practitioner, toggling or swinging between the two extreme. Want to gratify, gratify, gratify. Hey, you're not supposed to gratify, and then don't give, don't give, don't give. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? You will, you will go into the two extreme. Cannot do it. Must not give it in. Give it in means spoil it, spoil myself like that. So you go into the other extreme. But this is the middle path. Leh. Middle path actually means understanding the mind. Learning to manage your own craving and start to let it go slowly. Understanding how your mind works. So you need to moderate. Sometimes you know you can't win this battle. This craving battle is overwhelming you. You can't win it. Let it be. Do it wisely. Just know that you're doing it. You let it be. You give it in. You give in once. So craving one, you zero. Okay? <laughs> Tomorrow, your mind is very full of joy. Your practice is good. Craving arises, you say, never mind, you're not getting it today. And he didn't get it. You won. <laughs> Craving zero. <laughs> not good enough. Learn it. Learn how you won this battle. Recognize how you won this round. See how when certain conditions come together, it's easier to say, I will beat you this round. And what does that mean? If you can see it objectively, if you can see arising objectively, and if you are not so caught up with, 
I need to beat you. I need I I I need to beat you. If you're not so caught up with it, you're actually quite relaxed about it. It's easier to beat the guy. I'm talking like it's a third person, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah it's a third person. And it's, it gets easier. Then you know that uh, what you chu the jue zhao zhe ge shi zui hai ma? This is your best that you can do. I can watch you already. I know how you look like. I know when you will give up. I know, I know that you will let go on your the craving. That means it goes in the I tell you it goes, I assure, I assure you, it goes in a cycle. Okay? It gets more intense, it will get weaker. You recognize this cycle of intensity and relax. You learn it, you know that it will fade away. You only have to ride the cycle. And once you start to recognize it, you will go to recognize because yours may be less than mine, yours could be more than mine, that kind of thing, you never know. Huh? So once you start to recognize this, it gets easier and easier. Until one fine day, craving gets very mild. Very, very mild. You have won already. Game, set, match. Okay, never mind. I think I did it the other way around. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? Okay. Okay. That's it. It's, uh, you know, let me tell you a story. In the Majjhima Nikaya, first sutta, Mula Pariyaya Sutta, first sutta in the Majjhima Nikaya, Mula Pariyaya Sutta, uh, Buddha gave a discourse on the root of everything. The root of everything, okay? At the end of the discourse, there was a stunned silence. Not unlike this. There was a stunned silence. And for the first time, if you look at all the discourses, the monk always end up saying, Sadhu. But this one, they didn't say anything. <laughs> Because that particular discourse, they didn't understand. So in the same way that you, when this thing is uploaded, you go through it, see whether it helps you to understand a little bit better. Perhaps when you start to understand it a little bit better, it wouldn't sound like foreign language, alien speech. Okay, question. Yes. Did uh, the, the Buddha specify a sequence by which we are to understand the three characteristics of existence uh, in the path to obtaining Nirvana? The presentation suggests that there's a sequence. We first need to understand Apanicca before we can understand Anatta. Yes. Uh, so if there is indeed a sequence as specified by the Buddha, uh, where does the understanding of Dukkha in the sequence. The sequence actually is Anicca Dukkha Anatta. In the Anatta Lakana Sutta, go read Anatta Lakana Sutta, the Buddha asks, can you see that your phenomenal, the, phen the fact the phenomenal is impermanent? Then they say yes. And then he asks, is anything that is impermanent Dukkha or Sukha? And they say Dukkha. And then if it's dukkha, can you say that there is permanent I mean there is a atta in it? And they all say no, it's anatta. So the sequence is that way. If you understand anicca, you will understand dukkha, you understand anatta. Okay, how does it work? Actually, if you were to take it, just just look at your own. I prefer to take it back to your own experience, huh? your own life experience. If you see something as impermanent, right? You see the thing arises and it falls away. Your sensation, your feelings, your thoughts, it comes and it goes, right? It may dawn on you that actually this, this is a particular type of dukkha. You see this change and you say, change is scary. Change is potentially problematic. If I'm enjoying life, why do I want change? If I'm experiencing delight, I don't want things to change. 
But instead, you can't stop change. You like it or not, the very nature of life experience is change. It's changing. So seeing strategically, if you lift up and you just look at change, change is scary. I mentioned much earlier that in ancient time, if you find a space, prehistoric time, huh? you're running around loose, on a, you don't have a proper house, no proper shelter at night. If you find a place and it's safe and you hide there, you don't want change because change could kill you. And if you are in this world, in this time, most of us, we don't want change either. If, if, if our life is good, we don't want change. It's only when life's not so good, you want change. You hope that by flipping the channel, it gets better. But if you are content, you're satisfied, you think it's good, you don't want change. Do you want people to die? No. Do you want yourself to grow old? Not really. But when you are sick, yeah, I want to get better. When you're better, you don't want to get sick. We have choices. Lah, huh? We want to make certain choices. But the reality is change as a notion is unsettling. So in that sense, if you see it strategically, change. Change is disturbing. And that is why looking across civilization, looking across culture, you will always find somewhere, somehow, a religion that will talk about permanence. No change. Eternity. We look at history of time. You're looking at history. You're not looking at just one, one part of time. Throughout history, people will talk about when you die already, then it's forever like that. No more change. So, change presents problems. If you see it strategically, you'd rather not have it. So that is very dukkha. That's scary. Okay, that's one way of seeing it. Now, if you ask yourself this, I am in control. If you say, I, that is me, I am in control. If you are in control, do you want to create conditions that become dukkha? Seriously? Ask you to go build a house, you build a house that would drop on you. If you are in control and truly in control, you don't want conditions that are dukkha. Suppose I give you a free pass. You can mold your life anywhere, any way you like. And you can do whatever you like. It's like you are painting, okay? And in your painting, you can paint whatever you want. And what are you going to paint? You are going to make sure that you are rich, nice to have wealth around. A car that works, no puncture tire. You will have um, good friends who will be there for you forever and ever. You want a nice house, not one that leaks. You want everything just nice, perfect. Your body, just talk about your body. If you are truly in control, there's truly you in control, the guy who's driving in there, your mind wouldn't, wouldn't create problems for you. Your mind would be perfect. And always happy. Why have sadness? Your form will not break down. It will always work. Your knees do not creak when you sit. When you stand, you can stand. <laughs> you understand? So because there is no one driving, no one home driving, then your system runs by itself based on condition. There is a mental system, a mental ecosystem happily running by itself. There is a physical ecosystem running by itself. You have absolutely no control, no say over it. And it does its own merry thing. Okay, you have some say. You can choose not to put awful things in. But then if your DNA is such that even you give it good things also, it will give problems. Then bupieno, conditions. You see what I'm saying? So, 
this is how it links, if you can see the link. Impermanence is easy to see. Fear of change is not difficult to understand. And then the next jump is, can you see that you're not in control? There is nothing in control. There's no one there running the show. There is an ecosystem going on by itself. And if you can see that, congratulations. That's the three characteristics. The first noble truth states that uh, there is dukkha. Dukkha is to be understood. So in practice, do we pay attention to dukkha? Or do we pay attention to anicca? Having understood anicca, we will understand dukkha. You do both. You do both. You need to understand... Okay, ah. Uh, You have to understand that the mind, in order that the mind can see Dhamma, that the mind is able to taste Dhamma, realize Dhamma, the mind has to be of a certain state. It's not any mind. Normal day, daily life mind can't see Dhamma for nuts. Okay? It's a certain state, certain quiet, certain uh, calmness, sharpness, Concentrated, detached, light, happy. You need all these conditions there, then the mind can see Dhamma. So you have to prepare the mind to get to that state. You have to do a, quite a bit of preparation. Okay? In order that you can do this preparation properly, one of the things you need to do is really to understand concepts. All the Dhamma concepts, Anicca, Dukkha, Anatta, Four Noble Truths, Eightfold Path, Conditionality, all the concepts, you need to have an idea. You have to have the idea, you have to mull over it, you have to think about it. But don't worry, it hasn't started yet. It is just collecting the pieces. After all the preparatory work, which includes the meditation and the mindfulness practice, after all the preparatory work, the mind is somewhat ready, it's quiet now. It's happy, it's light, it's sharp, it's clear. You need all these, huh? non-negotiable. Cannot today, I think, drop this one. Huh? I'm not so good at this. Drop, drop, drop mindfulness, put it aside. Cannot, it has to be there. When these, all these guys are array, uh, aligned, sorry, when they're all aligned, that's when you watch the mind. What do you watch for? You watch for Dukkha, the noble truth of Dukkha. Can you see it? You look for anicca, impermanence. Can you see it? And you should. If your mind is quiet and it's clear, it's sharp, it's light, it's open, it's detached. You have all these there, your mind can see anicca. The mind can spot dukkha. And if your mind is sharp enough, you are, and your, your grasp of the concepts is there, you may even, it may even hit you, another, all of them. So what do you see? You actually look for all of them. But they come one at a time. They don't chong, uh, everybody try to fight through the mental door. It, it don't, it's one at a time. And Buddha kept saying, gradual path, gradual path, gradual training, gradual path. It means, Stages, step by step. Don't know which one will hit you first. Okay? But it will come. One more question. Sister Sylvia, just now in the slide, there is a term called unconditioned bliss. Can you explain what is unconditioned? You see, for many of us, our joy depends on something external. Whether it's a praise, whether it's a profit, a gain of sort, whether it's something we managed to get, we wanted and we got it, all this brings joy. If, your, if the arising of joy in you does not depend on any external condition, the arising of the joy is because deep down there is no craving, there is no wanting. 
there is just a quiet mind. That joy, that bliss, does not depend on external condition, unconditioned. Okay? Is the joy, is the joy something like Or is it kind of like euphoria? Um, no, well, it can be strong, but it's not euphoric. Euphoric sounds a bit out of control. No, no, it's just quiet cotton. It's like a cotton wool is there. But it's not, uh, it's not, let's go out and celebrate. Celebrate. No, no, it's not. It's just quiet. It's there. Uh, it comes from within. And if you look at it, it's just happy, pleasant feeling. Very strong, pleasant feeling. Why? You feeling? <laughs> <laughs> just think of it as uh, okay. Uh, 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 trying to think of an example. Uh, suppose, let's say, you are feeling very pleased for the day. Okay, you're feeling rather pleased. It's a good day. Today has been a good day. And then you go for a nice walk up Mount Favor. Here, not many hills, lah. So Mount Favor, okay? Yeah, up. Eh, so nice. No tourist buses. No, it's quiet. <coughs> nobody around. And you see sunset. Okay, you sit there and you're looking at sunset. This side is west, right? Yes. Not because we see sunset, but this side like east. <laughs> West, okay. So you see sunset, right? sunset thing. The whole place is so beautiful, bathed in lovely pink colour. Maybe a bit purplish. Can you imagine? Yeah? Nice colour. You have no worry. You had a good day. Your mind is relatively quiet. Your family is in your ear. So you're feeling very good, very peaceful. And now you're looking at a beautiful sunset. Can you imagine? can see the joy. It's a bit like that, but maybe plus a few more notches. Lah. So there's a quiet, calm, peace with the world kind of sensation. I, except that if you are practicing very well, then that sensation doesn't need the sunset. And also doesn't need Mount Favor. <laughs> it will just be there by itself. And then for someone like a Buddha, I'm, I'm imagining that it would be a lot more strong, a lot more intense. So something like, just now you ask us to do the one second and half second. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. <laughs>